This is North Pod, a North Melbourne fan podcast, hosted by Jason Hunt. Hello, welcome back to North Pod. Um, it's going to be a flat episode, I think. I think we're all feeling pretty flat after that. I'm your host, Jason, and um, yeah, I guess we'll just try our best to get to get through the next, I don't know, half an hour, 40 minutes or so, and then by extension, the next four, four matches, because... Yeah, that was that was something. We we lost the West Coast Eagles, who are I mean, you know, the percentage is fifty percent. They're the worst side this year. Um and yeah, I mean at, at times we were able to make them look pretty good to be honest. Um I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what to say. Like, Darling wound the clock back three or four years. Um, Oscar Allen looked like prime Wayne Carey out there. Yeah, we we teased in the last couple of minutes. It looked like maybe we were we were going to come back and steal it. Sheasel thought he would got it back to a point. Curtis lined up to try and kick his fifth, get us level. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, in the end, we, we got what we deserved, I guess. And uh, yeah, we we now hold the longest losing streak in the league at seventeen in a row. Yeah, at one point I thought it was going to be a draw. I thought what what better way to have the the worst two sides that haven't won for seventeen weeks in a row? Uh, you know what what better result than for them to draw? But um, it wasn't to be. Yeah, we went down by five points, seventy two to sixty seven. And yeah, it's just, I, I'm flat. I think any North Melbourne supporter, after having watched that, would be flat or angry or both. And um, yeah, I don't think I'm angry. I just think I'm deflated. And, you know, I was thinking during the game, because at times, you know, it looked like we were going to get belted and then we, we brought it back and... I was thinking during the game what what feeling I might have if we were to win. Like, would it be relief? Will it would it be happiness? And I I don't like obviously I don't know because it didn't happen. I got really nervous at the end, but I think quite honestly it would have just been relief. Anyway, I guess we'll never know because we did we didn't we didn't win, and you know there's a good chance now that we'll, we'll end the year on two wins. Um, we've got Melbourne, Essendon, Richmond and the Suns to come. So, you know, we don't have a proverbial easy beat left. There's ever a chance we could steal one of those games, of course, but yeah, just a really, a really flat way to end the weekend, unfortunately. Um, in terms of story of the game, I mean, we lost to the 18th place side. That's the story. Um, we we weren't able to stop West Coast playing the way that they wanted to play. It they just it really reminded me of the Hawks game in round three when um they just kicked it short and played keepings off, and were able to sort of bite off those relatively easy kicks and move the ball forward. And yeah, they did it again. That well, not again. That. The Eagles did it to us this time. The Hawks did it to us earlier in the year. Um, I think particularly on on the larger Optus Stadium ground, it just, you know, our zone didn't hold up. And it was quite amusing at times. Like, we obviously had a... Our game plan was essentially don't stand the mark unless it's inside the opposition's forward 50. Um, Go outside the five and, and try and be part of the zone. But it just... I think it really allowed... West Coast, the time and the space to make a good decision. And, you know, there was, you know, I, I'm lost for words, sorry. I think it clearly didn't work. Um, and they were just able to control the ball way better. Um, when the game opened up a bit and it was slingshot later in the game, we, we looked a lot better. But 
we weren't able to control the ball like they were. Um, and, you know, they only kicked 72 points in the end. Like They, they managed 10 goals. Uh, it was just our inability to, to move the ball the way that they were because ours was a couple of sideways kicks and then bombed down the line. That was what it ended up being looking like for us. And yeah, just they 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 actually looked like a good side at times. And I'm not saying they are. I just I think that's what frustrates so much because um, you know we know that they're a bad side like us. They've got some really young players that, you know, maybe are going to make it, maybe aren't. They've got some older players that haven't been playing super well. I don't know if that sounds familiar at all to, to anyone. And, yeah, they just, at times, they made us, they, they looked really skillful. So there's a, an element of that that's got to got to be reflected back on the amount of pressure that we were putting on. And, um, yeah, I thought we were outcoached or at least out outplayed in terms of the game plan because the West Coast was able to to execute what they were trying to do and we, well, I don't know, like either we weren't able to get into the game, the offensive game that we wanted to or it it did not work at all because, yeah, really the only time that it looked looked like it might be working was when the pressure was on West Coast at the very end to hold the lead. So... Yeah, a really, really tough watch. And I think, you know, we were all nervous coming in because it's the first game of the year or the first game in a long time where we were kind of had that level of expectation to win. And we saw what happened. We we failed. Um, three stars feels a bit... Really, I thought we only had one star, and that was LDU. Uh, again, just backed up, had another 30 disposals, six marks, six tackles, eight clearances, six inside 50s kicked a goal and yeah like similar to last week just far and away a best midfielder looked dangerous moving the ball through the middle of the ground um just breaking those lines he got caught once or twice trying trying to do a bit too much but in fairness to him there was a lot for him to do um so yeah a, a really good game again from LDU it's kind of crazy you know how how well he's been able to play um given you know what what's around him, I guess, because uh, he's he's really been a one man band the last couple of weeks in the midfield, and yeah, and he was again I think clearly our best player. If I if I'm going a second star for North, I mean Paul Curtis probably gets the chocolates. He kicked four goals, had 15 touches, a couple of contested marks, and yeah, I mean he hasn't hit the scoreboard like that at all this year. So that was great to see him kicking goals, a couple from the goal square, launched one from outside 50 on the run or sort of turn, turn and hit it from a clearance. Uh, he should have had five. He hit one and he had another shot. It was actually his first one in the in the goal square and, and hit the post when it was probably harder to miss. So, yeah, great to see him hitting the scoreboard. Probably is it reflected a bit in that, you know, the the opposition isn't fantastic, but it was great to see... He was able to kick some goals, took a late mark that, you know, he went back and unfortunately missed. So, yeah, a good game from Paul Curtis. And it's great to see that, you know, the the patience with him this year has worked because he has at times put out some average performances, which is, as a second-year player, is totally reasonable for what it's worth. Uh, But, yeah, it was good to see him hit the scoreboard. I thought... It's a couple of different ways to go with the the staff of the Eagles, but I, I've gone with Bailey Williams. I just think he really he was really influential around the ground, um, intercepting us. He had seven intercept possessions, which you know isn't a huge amount, but I, I feel like the ones that he was having he, they were really impactful. He had twenty three disposals, five marks, three were contested, four tackles, uh, twenty four hit out, seven to advantage, six clearances. He just he really stopped a lot of our attacks and thrusts forward. And, um, yeah, I thought he was really influential, as I said, around the ground in the contest. The six clearances was a big one, and he certainly looked better in the air than um, than Cherry did, uh, and Goldstein, for that matter, to be honest. He was just – he was that classic modern ruckman in that when the ball hit the ground, he was quite similar to another midfielder. I haven't seen him um, do that before, so – yeah, I thought he was probably their most important player. 
I mean, Oscar Allen was fantastic up forward too. Kelly and Cripps were good uh, good in the middle. Dom Sheed wasn't bad. So there, was a, there was a few to go around. Jack Darling played like a man possessed, particularly in the first half. Uh, if he'd kept that going, perhaps perhaps it could have been him. So, yeah. Unfortunately, there was there was several Eagles players I could have picked. Um, but, yeah, I thought Bailey Williams really... He was the one that frustrated me the most, I, I guess, because he was plucking marks that you wouldn't expect him to when he was getting into all of those uh, annoying positions for us as, as North fans. So, they're the three stars, LDU, Curtis, and Bailey Williams. Um, and that's the story of the game. We we lost to we lost to West Coast. Um, this is where I'd normally uh, do my call to action. I just want to really thank everyone for listening to the podcast this year. <laughs> Sounds like I'm wrapping up for the year, and part of me wants to, but I'm not. I just you know it's really hard watching 17 losses in a row, and I think you know I I know in the past if my sport team hasn't been going as well. It's easier to kind of drop off listening to or watch consuming content about it because you you just don't want to, you know, live in that world where, where things aren't going well. So I really do appreciate uh, everyone for listening to the podcast and conversing with me on social media and, and that kind of thing. Um, it's kind of like therapy this, I guess. And um, I've really enjoyed making the podcast this year despite you know, what what we've had to deal with on the field. So, yeah, I just really want to thank thank the listeners. Um, thank you for, for listening and supporting the podcast because, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's helped, helped give me a bit of a purpose when, you know, the footy team has been losing 17 in a row. So, yeah, hopefully we can end the year on a bang and, and do some cool stuff over the summer. But, um, yeah, just wanted to really shine a light on on, on the listener. So continue to share me out with any North Melbourne fans that you, that you know, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, subscribe on your podcast service. Give me a rating, a review, follow me on social media at North pod show, um, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, threads, all, all that good stuff. Let's jump in to the bads and you might be surprised to know that there's several bads and not as many uh, positives this week, but um, we'll try and whip through them. First negative, I mean, how can I go past the first quarter and the third quarter as a whole? Uh, we just let them control the ball. I kind of talked about it in the story of the game part. It just lived in the West Coast's half of the ground for most of those quarters, and it was played at, at their tempo, they were chip kicking it around. We weren't able to stop them or or slow them down. Uh, and when we did get possession, they just swarmed us and put heaps of pressure on us. So, yeah, I mean, we lost the first quarter twenty six to seven, and we lost the third quarter twenty four to zero. We didn't score in the third quarter, uh, and there was no no wind or anything going towards that end. Because uh, then in the last quarter, I think the, the Eagles only scored a point and we scored four goals. So it was just one of those funny funny games where the momentum swung around. But if from quarters one and quarter three, you're de- we're down 50 to seven, I think that kind of shows, you know, why we, why we lost the game. We, there was patches where we just weren't able to assert any authority at all. It was, yeah, you could just, you could tell that any of our quick kick forwards, quick kicks forward were just getting snuffed out and, um, in contrast, their slow control play, you know, looked looked fine, looked good. Um, so, yeah, just those quarters were probably... Uh, they're up there with some of the most frustrating quarters I've watched all year. It wasn't... We didn't leak the amount of goals that we have in other matches, but in terms of our capacity to to play offense during that those periods, well, I mean, there was no capacity. <laughs> um, it was shocking to be honest so yeah that that's got to be a negative we just weren't able to swing the momentum in those quarters at all the second negative just the tackling pressure game was won by the eagles and i think anytime we were trying to chain up handballs or run run with the ball through the middle they snuffed it out they tackled in swarms and, and were always one step ahead of us i guess um cripps had 11 tackles 
he was relentless, just tackled all day and um, was really dis- – he and West Coast were really disciplined in the way they tackled. Like, they really didn't give away – uh, too many free kicks for high tackles or for tripping anything like that. Yeah, they were they were really strong, and you can tell particularly with our mids. Like LDU got a bit frustrated because at times he was being held kind of just before he took possession, which you know I'm not I'm not complaining about from the umpire's perspective that that, that happens at every stoppage, but I'm just using that to illustrate you know they were right on top of us and um, swallowing us up as soon as we we did take possession. So. Yeah, we just invited the pressure um, with the way that we handballed it. All of our disposals were kind of 5 or 10% off. And, I mean, that's been a theme all year. We were not able, we're not skillful enough to move through opposition that, that play a strong defense like that. We just pass the pressure down to the next person and hope that they can do it. And really, the only player that I can think of that has been consistently able to, to handle that kind of pressure has been... Sheasel and you know he's a first year player so yeah the the tackling was just f- frenetic by the Eagles um, they only won the tackling count 71 to 67 so they had four more tackles but the big difference maker was they had 26 tackles inside their forward 50 and we had five so you know there's where the game was won and lost in that they were just so powerful and keeping it inside their forward line and, and therefore giving themselves a chance to, to score. And that's why they ended up, you know, with five more scores than we did because the ball lived down there. They had more inside fifties and they spent more, more time with the ball in their half. And a lot of that was due to their pressure, which we, you know, we just weren't able to match. I think probably in the, the second and the, and the fourth quarter, we were kind of level or just ahead of them, but across the, you know, the majority of the game, it was it was not what we wanted to see, unfortunately. As a result of what I've just mentioned, this is the third thing. Um, the service to the forwards, and and in particular Nick Larkey, was just awful. We've seen this at times this year. It's nothing new, but you just would have loved, given the defence that West Coast had, I think... To be fair, the commentators throughout the game were really selling Shannon Hearn short. Like, I know that, you know, Larky's got a good 10 centimetres on him and obviously age on his side. But, you know, Shannon Hearn's been a fantastic player for however long, like probably nearly 15 years at this point. Um, And he's a really smart, really strong player. So, you know, it's not as if he's completely useless and on one leg. That being said, he was really all they had. Like they had Bazo down there as a young defender, and he they subbed him out during the second quarter, fairly at yo, which apparently was tactical. So that was was interesting. But the fact that Larky didn't kick a goal in the first half, and sure he he missed one, he should have or one one or two that he should have kicked. Um, it was just constantly kicking it over his head or kicking it to the opposition players' advantage. And some of that was from the pressure that the Eagles were putting on, absolutely. Uh, but some of it was just butchering the ball, which, you know, we're, we've really become experts at this year. No, who am I kidding? We've become experts at over the past three or four years. It was fortunate that Paul Curtis was, was on today in terms of his crumbing, uh, which is why he was able to to kick those four goals, because a couple of those were really crumbing uh, Larky's efforts and... And finishing off the contest that he created, but yeah, I mean, just just a really really hard day to be a North Melbourne forward. Um, Steve O really didn't see much of it, and I, I think I'll talk about that in a minute. Like, it was Curtis and Larky, and, and that's really it down in the forward line. But I don't think that was all their fault. I do think the service coming in was yeah, it was it was not good, and some of that's on Larky because he probably needed to get himself into better position sometimes and and try and um you know get get out on the lead more often but yeah when the ball's coming in the way it was a lot of the time it's hard it's hard to blame Larky because there was just no no predictability about the way it was coming in I guess um the next point was there was just a couple of signs and this this really shouldn't be surprising but there was some signs that the heads were really dropping um and we were playing as though we were defeated I think the example that I want to talk about was 
uh, Taron Thomas, who early on I thought he was, you know, playing really well through the middle, playing really strong, and uh, whilst he wasn't necessarily winning every contest, he was competing hard and and trying to burst out of um, stoppage situations or out of traffic. But yeah, there was a period there in the third quarter where I guess to me he just kind of lost it. Um, there was a ball up, repeat stoppage in the middle. For some reason, he threw the ball to someone else rather than throwing it to the umpire for for the ball up. Uh, and the umpire decided to to pay a free kick against him, which, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I, I think that free kick is there. I don't know if it's always paid, but again, it's the classic. You kind of invite the free kick. You give the the umpire the, the option to, to pay it against you. And I, I think he really dropped his head after that because... Um, you know, the Eagles went and kicked a goal as a, as a result of that free kick. And then, yeah, a couple of minutes later up the other end, he, Taron Thomas tried to put a tackle on. Uh, that tackle was broken and he just gave up on the play. Like he, rather than giving that repeat effort and trying to tackle the, the Eagles player, he just, he, he gave up on it and he really dropped his head. And yeah, I mean, that, that's that's the stuff that hurts, I guess. Like, You've just, I get it, we've we have lost a million games in a row. So I think as a player, it's much harder to just, you know, go back to the well and try again. But when it's kind of self-inflicted, it's tough, I think, because, you know, he, he should have he should have done the right thing. He should have given the ball back to the umpire and then maybe he's not feeling so negative when, when the ball goes up the other end. But yeah, I think that's the classic we're, we're a month out from the end of the season it's been another long year and and i saw some you know some depleted players and some bad attitudes which you know comes with losing 17 games in a row so i just yeah i i don't i don't want to see that kind of stuff i guess i don't i don't even know where i'm again this is such a rambling podcast and i, I do apologize but yeah i guess if I'm allowed to drop my head if the players are <laughs> dropping their heads. Uh, next negative, let's keep keep going. The clearance quality was poor. We actually won the clearances 46 to 33. Uh, first half, we were really smashing them in the clearances. But as, I don't know, I'm an absolute broken record in this one, but we've got to do something about it. It was just too often a really bad kick or the kick was kind of a 50-50 kick and it just went straight back out of our forward line. We just don't seem to have that synergy between the midfielders and the forwards at the moment. Um, we haven't for most of the year. And then the, we don't have forwards that will pressure well enough and, and keep it in there. And I, I think it's a bit of both, right? Like the forwards have got to do better to, to pressure and keep it in there. But the mids cannot just bomb it, like chuck it on the boot around the corner, 40 metres, shallow entry to an opposition player's advantage. Like, that's it's doing no one any favours, and we're a decent um, a decent side. We've got to be... We've got to be better... Sorry, we're not a decent side. We're a decent clearance side. Um, so we've, we've got to actually take advantage of the fact that we're getting clearances and not just bomb it without looking and give our forwards no hope. On the forward pressure part, I mean, you know, I don't think there's too many North fans that were stoked to see Turner back in. And I think we saw the quintessential Kane Turner game where he started really well. He had a couple of smothers, kicked our first goal, um, and then was virtually unsighted for the rest of the match. You know, he just does not have the capacity to impact contests and the game long long term. I think he had another smother later on and uh, one little chip kick, like kick off the ground that kind of kept the ball more moving and... That's his contributions for the game, um, so I, I can't, I can't cop that. Hanson Junior, you know, he debuted, but he was virtually unsighted. And again, I'm not having a go at him. I'm just, this is what the forward line mix looked like. Stevenson was really quiet um, again, except for one really fantastic passage, which um, led to a lucky goal where he ran down the wing. I think he took three or four bounces and waited for the right moment to kick it short to Larky. Um, I, just, I think the forward line's really missing Zerha, but that being said, our forward pressure wasn't fantastic with him in there either. So, yeah, there's just something that stinks about that, that forward line group at the moment in that we just don't have enough players in there that can retain the ball and um, put put pressure on. So, 
I mean, yeah, it's it's nothing new. We know it, but it just it hurts when it when it keeps coming up. I guess you don't want to get beaten by what you know. Um, and we know that our forward line pressure is bad, and our entries into the forward line also bad. And that's just my professional opinion. Um, last negative, uh, just the game on on the line. We we just tried to go through the middle several times and do do not have the skills to get it done. We couldn't get it uh, into the forward line fast enough or with enough advantage created for our forwards. It just kept breaking down. You know, we, we had what looked like for a competent side, an option or a channel down the middle. And, you know, inadvertently we, we'd end up with a ball up in the middle or we'd turn it over. Um, we just weren't able to push it um, far enough and get that last final goal we we couldn't take the lead and um, put the pressure back on the Eagles because we we did have, you know, all the momentum in that last quarter, but we just, I don't know, it kind of reminded me of that Richmond game from last year that we eventually won where neither side really looked like they were good enough t- to win, but someone has to. So, yeah, that's just a classic. We've seen those skills on show all year. Um, I'm not surprised looking at them, but it's, yeah, it's disappointing. So, yeah, I could go on with negatives. I've got probably five or six more, but I won't. I'll try and um, work my way through a couple of positives now because there were there were a few things that we could take away. I've already kind of, kind of touched on this, but Paul Curtis hitting the scoreboard was was really fantastic. He, I don't know if he would have kicked more than two in a game this year. I can't even think off the top of my head of a game where he kicked two, but I'm, I'm sure there would be one one or two. Um, so him kicking four goals was great and Larky was able to eventually join him. He missed a couple early but but kicked two in the end. You know, those two, I think, overall had good games. It was just, you know, I think we have to take Curtis's game with a grain of salt because at the end of the day, he's playing against West Coast. And I know that sounds harsh, but it's... He's not playing against a fantastic small defender. He he sort of made quite a few mistakes. So, yeah, I just think let's take it with a grain of salt. He's kicked four. It's great. I think it's a good bit of confidence going in towards the last month. But, you know, it's nothing to write home about ultimately. Um, but we take it. We'll take four goals. He, he could have had five, should have had five. Um, and Larky hitting the 50-goal mark for the season is a great achievement. In in such a poor side, to kick 50 goals for the year, is it's tremendous, to be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, still four games to go, so he he could potentially sort of end on maybe 60-odd if, he, if he's able to kick two or three from the last each of the last games. Uh, but regardless, even if he sort of trails off and he finishes in the low 50s, I think that's still a fantastic return for... Um, a tall forward, particularly playing in a in a bottom two side. Yeah, he's really just been the lone lone forward, except for really early in the year where he just looked a bit off. Like the first got first game where he kicked six against the Eagles. I'm talking about beyond that. Uh, probably had a month there where I think he was a bit he was a bit injured and and didn't look particularly good. Um, past that, he's been pretty consistent all year and that he's been able to kick a couple and he's had a few games where he's kicked a couple more than a couple so yeah it's nice to have a key forward who can kick goals having uh Jai Simkin back was was great um he, he went in and out of the game but he had a couple of really classy moments where it just reminds you you know what he what he can do when he's fully fit and firing um he finished with 20 disposals had six clearances yeah, it was just really classy and close. I think probably his first half was better than his second half. A couple of jab steps that he took and beat some people on the on the wing. Um, yeah, I just think it's easy to forget that he's won back-to-back best and fairest. And just because of he's had those repeat concussions, he broke his hand. He's had such an interrupted year and hasn't had a good run in it. But we see these glimpses where you go, oh, that's right. Like, he's our captain and probably our second best midfielder so yeah good to have him back hopefully he can bring you know some some of those glimpses and bring that consistently into the last month of the season i mean yeah here we go this is how how deep i'm digging for positives this week this one's a bit of a humorous one um 
Cherry is is quite strong, and he he wins hitouts. Don't like I think similar to Goldstein. Goldstein's been a, a big hitout fiend for us, hence all time leader of hitouts in in the AFL. I do think we're replacing him with another another ruckman who who's capable of a hitout, and um, it's just he. He needs to work on finding teammates, but there was two passages where it was kind of at the sort of the halfback flank. It's a boundary throw in. Cherry wins the um, the hit out. Essentially, just punches it diagonally towards the boundary line and in towards our goals. Gains about ten meters. Repeat throw in, and that proces- that procession happened two or three times, just moving it down the ground. It was. It was kind of laughable. It was like this is more effective than us actually winning clearance and and taking position because at least it's it's a neutral ball again this way and we get another ball up rather than turning it over. Um, yeah, it was strange to watch. As I said, it happened twice where he probably won three hitouts in a row and and gained ten or fifteen meters just by by tapping it out. Obviously. The West Coast fans were looking for insufficient intent, but unless you're um, punching it over the boundary on the full from a hit out or from a boundary throw in, rather, it's it's not going to happen. Um, so yeah, it was just bizarre to watch, and you know we're looking for positives. So go back and have a look at that if if you're looking for something a bit strange. Uh, I thought he had a pretty good game. Two cherry kicked two goals and and competed around the ground. He still needs to work on his marking around the ground. Um, he can make a contest, which is, you know, is the bare minimum. But I'd like to see him take a couple more marks and and be that outlet at half back that you know all the best ruckmen in the competition tend to be. But yeah, solid game. Um, I thought he was, he was better than last week, and the fact that he was able to kick straight and kick those two goals was super super handy. Sheasel going forward late nearly single-handedly won us the game. And we've seen this script before. He did it against the Swans and went forward for patches during that game, which we nearly won as well. Um, he found David Uniac with a central quick kick that was off the side of his boot. Um, he nearly kicked one over his head, and then he snapped what looked like was going to be the goal to get us level, but the goal umpire, I, I guess, thought it was going over the post. Because, yeah, Sheasel celebrated like he'd kicked it, but it didn't seem to remonstrate too strongly, so maybe he was trying to sell the, the goal umpires on it. But regardless, like his him going forward really you know, changed the game in that last sort of 15 minutes. Watching it, I, yeah, I wondered if maybe it's time to just throw him forward because he's so effective there, and I, I understand that he's, you know... He's super effective in the back line too, but maybe I, I, my my feeling having watched the end of that game was I think it's time to let the back line figure it out for themselves and we, we figure out what we need to do there, but we need him forward because he's just so dangerous there. Uh, he just got such good... He reads the ball so well, he knows where to be, um, and I think that's something that we really miss from a lot of our other crummers, like Paul Curtis was able to hit hit the right spots this game, but um, besides that, we've really struggled to to generate scores from our small forwards. So, look, it is what it is. There's four games to go. It's not going to matter big picture, but I do think we, we look a lot more dangerous when he's forward of the ball. So, yeah, that's literally the only positives I could find. The last one is just there's four more games left. Um, as much as it sucks this season it's nearly over and we can we can look to improving our list through the draft and trade period uh and hopefully take a step forward with with Clarko have a fresh start for next year yeah I don't really have any expectation that we're going to win any games now uh and who knows like we actually might end up with the first draft picked if West Coast is able to snag another win but yeah four four games to go and that's the positive right now I think it's um that's what the players would be feeling, or at least those players that are feeling like their their position's safe. Maybe those players playing for a contract might feel differently, but yeah, you'd think someone like Jai Simkin or Nick Larky is going, all right, four to go. All right, that's the game. In terms of other news from the week, I was I was going to talk about Jack Zebel retiring. I, I'll touch on it briefly here, but I think I might do a little bonus podcast midweek uh, just talking about Zeebel because it just doesn't feel right chucking 
chucking all of that in this podcast where I'm just feeling so flat and it's such a such a bad vibe. So yeah, he announced his retirement during the week as of the end of the year. So he'll finish up with 280 odd games and obviously cap in the side for five or six years. So, you know, great, a great achievement by him. But yeah, I might, as I say, I'll, I'm going to record a separate podcast um, and release that during the week. So I guess, yeah, join me, join me in reminiscing about Zebel's career during that. Yeah, I just, I feel like that might be better than, than jamming that in here. There was no other news aside from the fact that Clarko's returning. That's not that's not new. The VFL did play a game this week. Uh, played Werribee. I watched watched half of it. Watched the first quarter and the last quarter. And um, yeah, it was very windy, blustery conditions. Unfortunately, lost fifty three to one hundred and ten in the end. After a fast start, we kicked the first three goals. Um, going with the wind, and then yeah, after that it was all Werribee. Unfortunately, they're a good side in fairness, though. I think that was like their twelfth win in a row or something like that. So there was a bit to see there. Cooper Harvey was busy but inaccurate, kicked a goal. Lazaro looked good again, fifty-three, fifty-three. That's a lot. Twenty-five touches. Uh, Dawson looked pretty good, twenty-one disposals and seven marks. Um, so th- those are probably the three best AFL listed players. Um, a lot of the other ones were pretty quiet, like Powell, Drury, Bergman, Greenwood, Spicer. None of them really did too much. Cunnington was okay, but aside from potentially a farewell game, you know, I, I don't really think he's pushing for, for selection. So not a heap from the VFL. Like, it was good that Powell came back and, and returned because he's obviously been out for a little while with that injury. So potentially they were just looking to get some some miles into his legs and he could come back. But, um, yeah, Cooper, Lazara and Dawson were probably the best. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll look ahead to to next week's game, he says, with dread. Uh, Sunday one ten versus Melbourne in, in Hobart. So we've got a couple of games at the end of the year in Hobart. We've got this one and also uh, the last game of the year against Gold Coast is also in Hobart. So another Sunday game, but earlier in the day at least this time. And yeah, it's going to be Clarko's first game first game back. So who knows, maybe we can get that, that new coach bounce. Uh, it's not really a new coach, so it's just a returning coach. So I'm not sure how that works, but I guess, yeah, I might also take this opportunity just to say that I think Brett Ratton's done a fantastic job stepping into the void over this past couple of months. It's... Um, you know, I think it's really easy to underestimate what goes on behind the scenes in terms of being a senior coach. Um, I've seen a little bit of that in elite sport in terms of what you know a senior coach does during the week, and I think it's really easy for the fans to, to just perceive the coach to be sort of making those decisions and giving those chats on game day. But I mean, obviously, there's so much more that goes into it. So it's fantastic, been fantastic for us that someone with that experience and um, calmness of Brett Ratton's been able to come in and fill the void, but um, yeah, Clarko coming back. Who knows? Maybe, maybe he can give us that bounce, and we'll only lose by ten goals. <laughs> um, look, anything, anything would be better than the ninety point belting we copped earlier in the year. That was the same game that Charlie Combin went down with that horrific injury too. So, looking for something better this week, obviously. Uh, but yeah, no. Not high hopes at all. I um, yeah, Melbourne's in in decent form. It looked like maybe the Tigers were going to beat them this weekend, and then they kicked about seven goals straight in the last quarter to win it. So yeah, yep, four games to go. Um, just my last thought. I have been thinking a bit about some of the selection from the past couple of weeks. So I know certainly in the fan base, there's been a bit of uproar around how Hugh Greenwood's not getting a game and. I think there's merit in that for what it's worth. Um, but I, I think I'm reconciling it and then I think that we're we're playing players that, you know, are playing for their careers. And we've seen this over the past couple of years where we've given given players a game, not out of nowhere, but kind of, you know, that's that's kind of surprised um the fans and then, you know, a couple of months later we find out those players are being delisted. So I think 
yeah, this is a just more of that sorting out our list. Because, uh, you know, Greenwood's got a contract for next year. He's going to be in the team, and we know what he is. I think that the the coaches believe in Bergman. Like, we're not we're not cutting him again. He's got a contract. Cooper Harvey's got time. It's only his first year. Like, the players that we're trying to make decisions about are players like Lockie Young and, and Kane Turner and Daniel Howe. And so I think it's, yeah, they've been playing for their careers. And sure, I think it's probably easy to say, well, how can we not not know about those blokes yet, but, you know, it's the classic. I'm sure they've been working on things in the VFL and this is kind of their chance to, to show whether or not, you know, they're able to translate those things to to AFL level. I think, you know, if I was making a decision right now, I mean, Turner wouldn't, wouldn't be getting a contract, Howe wouldn't be getting a contract, and I, just based on how many cuts we have to make, I don't think that Lockie Young would be getting a contract either. Um, the only one that kind of bucks that trend is is Dawson. Um, it's kind of a bit odd to me that he hasn't got a game yet this year. But yeah, during the the members Q and A during the week, it sounded like potentially he's he's close to a run before the year ends. Like you never know how true that is. Um, and as I said, he, I thought he looked pretty good in the VFL today. But he's the only one that I I look at and go why. Why have we not given him a game or two just to be sure? Because yeah, looking at looking at him right now, it, it does seem as though he's gonna he's also gonna be delisted. But you you worry about what our what our defence stocks look like if if and when Mackay leaves and if we get rid of Dawson and Griffin Logues out all of or most of next year with the knee, uh, it's it's looking pretty dire down there. So yeah, anyway, that's just my thoughts on selection. I. I think I'm reconciling some of those strange decisions that way. And for that reason, I just, yeah, I don't really have any strong feelings about selection for next week against Melbourne. It'll be the same old. We we get the extended squad uh, on Thursday and there's a bit of confusion, a bit of, oh, I can't believe this person's, you know, in the 26 and then it gets cut back and we, we go, oh, yeah, there's only one or two surprises there. So, yeah, I'd be happy for... Turner to get another game if if that's what we're doing we're trying to trying to make some some last minute list decisions um yeah I just let's let's just make sure that we're also valuing getting getting some time into some of those young players because you know there's there's no such thing as wasted experience um you've even if you're getting belted I think you're better off playing AFL and, and learning a bit about yourself so Anyway, that's my my thoughts as someone who's never played at the top level. Um, thank you so much if you've made it this far into the podcast. It's um, it sucks watching a game like that, and I'm sure it's not super enjoyable listening to a podcast like this where it's just all negative. But um, you know, we're a we're a community of North Melbourne fans. We've got a we've got to stick stick fat um, and get through this together. So. Yeah, thanks again for listening. I hope, God, I hope that we all have a fantastic week because we know our weekends at the moment are pretty miserable. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll I'll talk to you again. Well, I'll talk to you again midweek when I re- talk about Jack Zebel retiring and then, yeah, probably, probably a Sunday night, Monday morning, Monday night type podcast release for next week after the Melbourne game. So... Have a great week, and as always, go North. Thanks for listening to another episode of North Pod. Please subscribe to the podcast on your app and give me a rating or review if you can. I'd really appreciate it. You can find me on all social media at North Pod Show. That's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, threads. You name it, I'm there. I'll see you next episode.